Hello everyone. We're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a mind expanding top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's topic, 10 major themes of scripture. The Lord has really big ideas. Blessings that are described as exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. That's because they're God-sized, of course. This video will be a little more robust than most, so get ready. We hope you enjoy it. The psalmist says the river of God is full of water. These studies are what Ezekiel called waters to swim in. Here we go with number one. <laughs> Our first major theme, forming and filling, the pattern of both creation and recreation. Well, you're right about these big, big ideas. This is a bit like someone announcing that the menu is turf and surf, and you find out that it's a whale and an elephant. Because <laughs> they're going to be like, that's some really big stuff here. But one of the ideas that we see right from the beginning of creation is this idea that God forms and then he fills. The first three days of creation, he forms, he sets the stage, he provides the environment, and then in the next three, he's filling it. And this idea that God begins with nothing, Hebrews 11:3 began the universe creating things that exist out of things that do not appear, and the same is true with the new creation, that he starts with nothing. The things that are nothing with his objective to bring to nothing the things that are, so that all the glory would redound to God. And why is that? Because God wants people to understand he puts value on them. He makes them for a purpose. And so this idea is that he fills us. What does he fill us with? He fills us with joy and peace and believing. He fills us with the fruits of righteousness. He fills us with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And not only that, he fills us with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, says the scripture. In fact, Paul goes so far as to pray for the saints that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. And why does he fill us? Well, so that we will abound. The word abounding isn't even used anymore. You know, pull into a gas station and you want them to abound with gasoline, well, that would be pouring it all over the ground, right? The idea of abounding is what a fountain does. It gives and gives with no interest in getting anything back. Just the overflow of the generosity of the heart of God. And so God's intention is to fill us to overflowing. And like the little chorus says, my cup is full and running over. And the idea is God wants us to pour out his blessing into the lives of others so that they too will enjoy the benefits that come from God. They'll come to know God as we have come to know him, as a generous hearted, overflowing God who gives us more than we can imagine. Number two, the sacrificed lamb and love as the ultimate superpower. Right from the outskirts of Eden, all the way through to the book of the Revelation, we're thinking about the Lamb. And in the Revelation, of course, we have the blood of the Lamb and the wrath of the Lamb and the book of the Lamb and the bride of the Lamb and the throne of the Lamb. The Lamb is everywhere. And, you know, this issue in the Bible of what is the difference between a man and an animal, the sad testimony as we were thinking about Cain, that those who follow the way of Cain, he says they act like brute beasts. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul warns if you get away from the worship of God, it's not too long until you're worshiping animals. And the sad judgment of God against the human race is, I didn't make you animals. I don't want you to worship animals because you become like what you worship. I want you to realize you are made in the image of God and you should worship God. Well, this is a theme that runs through the Bible. So in the book of Daniel, for example, we have the nations pictured as wild animals. And the same is true in the book of the Revelation. In Daniel, there's a king who starts acting like an animal. 
And the difference between a man and an animal is quite slight, actually, when you look at the higher primates. We're looking at someone who has a God consciousness, a sin consciousness, that differentiates us from animals. We have a sense of right and wrong. And when we lose that and start acting like animals, which is what Nebuchadnezzar was doing, God said, then you might as well live like an animal. And he ends up being hobbled in his royal garden, eating grass like an ox. So God makes a big point of this and says, look, don't act like animals. You're not animals. When we get to Revelation, this is the grand finale. And here are these hideous strength creatures, the beast. The number of the beast is 666. And says John, it's the number of a man. He's a beast with a human heart and mind. And God says, if that's all you're going to handle it, then here's my animal. And out comes this little lamb, as it had been freshly slain. Coming up against a great red dragon and all these other wild beasts, you say, I can't watch, you know, I mean, how's this going to end? Well, keep reading. The little lamb wins. And God's message in the book of Revelation is this, that there is a greater force in the universe than power, and that's love, and love is going to win the day. John says, the cry goes out, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. But John says, when I looked, I saw it was the little lamb. So it was not as the lion that he won the battle, but as that little lamb, as it were, freshly slain, hanging on the cross. That's where the victory was won. And it was love that never fails. It's love that wins the day. And that should teach us a great deal in our interaction with people that we're not going to win by being more powerful than they are. We're going to win the way the Lord Jesus won us by getting down and sacrificing ourselves as the little lamb did. And love will win the day. Number three the firstborn and his selection, the triumph of grace. Right from the very start, God accepts Abel over Cain. Cain is the one born first, but Abel is the one who is accepted based on grace. And right through the Old Testament scripture, this happens over and over again. This pattern is set that the one born first, who has a right by law, is bypassed to except the younger as the firstborn. So Isaac is accepted over Ishmael, and Esau is rejected, and Jacob is accepted over Esau, and Judah is accepted over Reuben. And remember the story of old Jacob. He learned a thing or two in life, and he crosses over his hands when he blesses Joseph's two boys. And he puts his right hand on the head of the younger of the two boys. And Joseph tries to correct this. And Jacob says, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. And so this is a principle with God. The concept of election or selection or choosing in the Bible is this idea that God bypasses those who have a right by law and he takes up those who are saved by grace alone. So we have Adam, the one born first, the first Adam, and Christ, the last Adam, he becomes the firstborn. Israel comes first, but the church is the church of the firstborn. And of course, when we take this and throw this up on the jumbotron, we realize the idea behind it is that you have two births. And it's not by your first birth, the natural birth, that you receive the blessing of God. It's by your new birth, your spiritual birth, that you receive his blessing. And once we begin to understand this, it's not what I am by my natural birth. And this is what the Jews struggled with regarding the Lord Jesus. And like, we have a right, we know who our Father is. We've been born into the right line. And Jesus said, no, you need to be born again, born from above. It's through the new birth, through the second birth, that you receive the blessing of God. So to say my father played the organ in the church for 43 years or my mother was this or whatever the case might be, that may all be well and good. But the blessing of God comes to those who realize this principle that God has bypassed those who have a right by law. Now what does that mean for those people? 
Oh, it means they can come too. They can receive the same blessing by grace, but not according to law. And so the Lord Jesus in John 10 would explain to the Jews who objected to this idea of Jesus taking sinners that they could come too, just like the other brother. But they're going to have to come through the same door that the prodigal comes through. They're going to have to come under the principle of grace. And that's one of the great themes in the Bible. And when we lay hold of that idea, we understand God's principle of election. That God has chosen us on grace, not for any other merit, but simply by grace. And this is now available to everyone. Not only those who claim to a right by law, but everyone can come by grace through faith in Christ. Number four, a tale of two cities. The long war between Babylon and Jerusalem. Fascinating study. The roots of Babel or Babylon, they go back to the early chapters of our Bible, Genesis chapter 11, where they say, in spite of what God says, he wants us to scatter and to fill the earth, we're going to stay together and we're going to build a tower that rises up to heaven. This is a picture of man's religion. It's not God coming down to men, it's men coming up to God. And we will do it ourselves. Let us make us a name. Let us build us a tower. And they called it Bab El, which means the gate to God. And God came down and he changed the name of their condo project to Babel, which means confusion. So God did come down, but he came down in judgment because they were in self, in pride and self-exaltation. They were seeking to do something that God had told them not to do. So that's going to be the characteristic of Babylon. It's a counterfeit. The scripture says they used bricks instead of stone and slime for mortar. And that's man's efforts, entirely designed by himself for himself. And God is left out of all of it. Well, the introduction to the city of Jerusalem is just a few chapters later, where we read about Abraham coming back from the battle of the kings, rescuing Lot, and the king of Salem comes out, Melchizedek bringing bread and wine. And this is a beautiful picture of Christ. This is not let us make us a name. This is the city where God has put his name. And interestingly enough, Abraham is coming back from a battle led by the king of Shinar. Now the plain of Shinar is where this tower was built in opposition to God. As we turn the pages of Scripture, we come to the children of Israel coming into the land of promise, soon to recognize Jerusalem as their capital, and we read about a man named Achan. And Achan selects for himself out of the spoils of Jericho something he was forbidden to do. This was all to belong to God, but the Scripture says he took a goodly Babylonish coat. Well, the word Babylonish is the word a Shinar coat. He was trying to look good in a Shinar coat. You see why God was so serious in his judgment of this man, that this was all that spoke of self-will, self-aggrandizement, opposition to God. It was the worst thing he could have done. Later on, Nebuchadnezzar comes to Jerusalem, takes away the treasures of the temple. Where does he put them? In the house of his God in the land of Shinar. The book of Zechariah describes the end times, uh, the, the day of the Lord. And we see there this garbage pail, this ephah, and in it is a woman whose nickname is wickedness. This is the mother of harlots. This is Revelation 17 and 18, which describes Babylon. And she's the queen of Babylon who has committed sexual immorality with the kings of the earth in an attempt to make a counterfeit to God and his way. And she's being carried away in the garbage. And these two women, thank God for godly women, with the wind of God in their wings, they carry her away and they dump her out in the plain of Shinar. So this is the last big battle. And the sad refrain in Revelation 17 and 18 is, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, her destruction comes in one hour. Whereas the next chapter describes the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And there the refrain is, Alleluia. All the hallelujahs in the New Testament are found in that chapter. 
what a glorious day it's going to be when finally the city where God's name is, the city of the great king, the city of the bride, is going to be revealed and Babylon will be destroyed. Then number five, the father-son motif, intimacy as the final objective of history. We see a distinctive shift when we come to Genesis 12. Up to that point, we have the nation sort of being arranged and being scattered and all the rest. And then suddenly God reaches down and he takes one man. And he begins to work with that man. And through that man, the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation, and God begins to work. Well, how does that chapter really begin? It begins with God promising a son. And this son coming seemingly late in the life of Abraham, as far as God was concerned, it's in the fullness of time. But then we see that father and son ascending Mount Moriah and the father offering his son there. So this is a very dramatic scene at Mount Moriah and it begins with the statement, take your son, your only son, whom you love. This is the first reference to love in the Bible, focusing not on the love between a husband and wife, but the love of a father for his son. Take that and throw it on the big screen. And once again, we come to Calvary. This is Mount Moriah. This is the father and his son. They went both of them together to Calvary. And there's no ram caught in the thicket this time. The son actually dies at Calvary. So that's going to be one of the, the big ideas throughout the Bible, the father and the son, and the son being offered there at Moriah. So when we think about this idea, God's ultimate objective, I do not believe is glory. Some people think that's the grand finale. I think it's intimacy. And I think glory is a means to an end. Glory is the revelation of divine character. And God has found all kinds of ways to do this through the physical creation, through the scriptures, through his son, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the transformation of God's people where his glory shines from our lives. But in every case, the whole objective is the revealing of God's character so that we are drawn to him. How God's heart must have broken that first cool of the day when he came to Adam and Eve and they were hiding from him in the garden as if he was some kind of monster. This was his longing to be near them, to be in close communion with them. And sin had come in. Sin had separated them from God. And so the whole grand story of the cross, in a sense, is this amazing detour to the grand objective of restoring us to intimacy with God. So we have been made near to him through the precious blood of Christ. That's God's plan. We who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. When we read through Paul's letter to the Romans, he's talking about the gospel and this grand detour that brings us back into fellowship with him. And when he comes to the sub-conclusion in Romans 8, what's it about? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And Paul goes through this long litany. There's nothing that can separate us. So I think that's really the heart and soul of the gospel. Come near to me, God says. Draw near with true hearts. I want you close to me. And Paul writes to the Ephesians that this is God's purpose, that we might be before him in love. That's the big idea. So we're going to follow that theme all the way through. Joseph, his brethren, who rejected him, who sold him like Jesus. They sold him. They finally are brought into his presence. And what does Joseph say to them? Come near to me. Come near to me. That's the heart of God. Come near to me. Elijah on Carmel. The people have turned to idolatry and all the rest. And at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah speaks to the people and he says, Come near to me. It's a beautiful thing. Watch for it all the way through scripture. David says, this is my one longing. This is my one desire. One thing have I desired of the Lord. I want 
to dwell in the presence of the Lord, inquire in his temple, behold the beauty of the Lord. That's what I want. What does Paul say? One thing I do. I want to get everything else out of the way and I want to go after him. I want to win Christ. I want that intimacy. That's the heart of the believer all the way through, to be near him, near to the heart of God, near to the Lord Jesus. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, one of the major themes in Scripture. Number six, faith and the construction of the world to come. So there's one main spar that holds everything together, and that's confidence in God. Uh, let not the rich man glory in his riches. That word glory means don't let him boast in, don't have confidence in his riches, in his wisdom, in his strength. But let him who boasts has confidence, have confidence in this, that he knows me. In a parliamentary system, a non-confidence vote is basically saying we're dissolving the government because we don't have confidence anymore. The breakdown of a marriage is all based on this. I can't trust you. I don't have confidence in you. Well, the main spar that holds the universe together is trust, is faith faith in God. So when we come to this great faith chapter of Hebrews 11, we see by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And God took things that don't appear and he turned them into things that do appear. This is a design for something that's much bigger than that. That's the only reference to creation. And the rest of the whole chapter is about people. People who have faith in God. And we discover that these people are living stones who are being constructed into God's home, God's dwelling place. And they're linked to him. The construction of this glorious building, the only building that will survive the collapse of the universe, that the, the rods, the spars, the structure, is faith. It's confidence in God. And so God is building a new world out of people. And these people are being built together into this dwelling place of God. And we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And in Revelation 21, we discover that the city, that the people and the place are so closely linked together that you can't tell the difference between them. John says, I saw the new Jerusalem. It was like a bride adorned for her husband. And when we look at the stones on the foundation and we look at the gates in the city, what? They have the names of people on them. They represent people. And so God is building this wonderful new world and he's building it out of people. And what kind of people? Not necessarily great people or clever people, but people of faith, people who trust in God. And that's the new world to come. So that theme is going to follow through when we read about the rebuilding in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra, the walls, the gates, all of this. These are all parables. These are symbols of something. And God is building this city and he's building it out of people. And uh, we are living stones and we're laid on the foundation of the chief stone. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. The one foundation that nothing can move, we can have absolute confidence in God because of the work and person and revelation of Jesus Christ. Number seven, God in the hands of sinners. All right, so the idea of the sovereignty of God is not so much God acting like he's a bully, he's in charge, he can do whatever he wants. It's God overruling man's stupidity, primarily. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a famous sermon by Jonathan Edwards, is true. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but it's not the main message of the Bible. Judgment is God's strange work after he has tried every other tactic. 
So we read of the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God. We read that God is slow to anger, but he's ready to pardon. So as we look at the stories of the Bible, we see God putting himself into the hands of sinners. Abraham at Sodom. Abraham is a friend of God. And God comes to him and says, I'm going to have to tell him about what I'm going to do. And using an anthropomorphism, in other words, God speaking as a man, he says, I've heard how bad it is down there. I'm coming down to see. As if to say, I'm looking behind every cupboard door. I'm looking in every drawer. I'm looking for any evidence of faith, any interest in spiritual things, any act of repentance. I'm going to rescue whatever I can. Ten men. He settles for a fair bit less than that. One man and a couple of his daughters, that's it. So when we think about God working in history, he says to Abraham, go ahead, take your best shot, so to speak. And Abraham intercedes on behalf of Sodom. We have something similar with Moses at Sinai when the people are sinning down in the valley below and God says, let me alone, get out of my way, I'm going down to destroy them. And Moses says, let me alone. Are, are you giving me a choice here? Well, then I'm not going to move. And imagine this, six feet of clay, arguing the case with God. He doesn't say they're nice folks if you just got to know them. He says, no, you're not that kind of a God. You made promises. You brought them out. And I, I'm asking you to relent, to change your mind on this matter. And the Bible says, and the Lord did. The question is, whose will was done that day? Whose will was done at Sodom? Whose will was done at Sinai? God's will was done. He was looking for people who would intercede for him, who would feel the way he did and plead their case. And later on, in the book of Zechariah, when he can't find anyone who's going to plead the case of Israel, they don't deserve his help, they've turned away from him. He says, I'll come down and I'll be my own intercessor and I'll plead their case. We have the story of Jacob at Peniel where he wrestles with the Lord. And the question is, why doesn't God pin him? Doesn't God have the power to do it? We read here, the Lord says, you're a prince with God because you have prevailed. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, you would assume that it was that Jacob did not prevail against the Lord. But no, he says, you have prevailed. Now, God had the power to do it. He didn't have the will to do it. Why doesn't he pin you? Why doesn't he force me to read my Bible? Why doesn't he force me to pray? He doesn't. That's not the heart of God. And so God puts himself into our hands and he gives us the opportunity to discover that, as Jacob learned, that it's not by wrestling with God that we win. It's by clinging to him. It's by stopping our wrestling and clinging and seeking his blessing. So when we come to the New Testament, this is the idea, isn't it? Uh, what is prayer? It's God putting himself into our hands. Ask my Father and he will do it for you. Do you mean Almighty God is standing by waiting for me to ask him before he does something? Evidently so, right? What is service? You are the hands of Jesus. You are the body of Christ. If he wants to cook a meal for some harried young mother, with kids and she's, she's at the end of her strength. And the Lord says, I think I'd like to make supper for her tonight. He goes looking for someone who has a kitchen and hands and he says, will you be my hands? We'll work together, I'd like you to do this. If he sees a lonely soul, he doesn't have a telephone and he looks for someone willing to use their telephone to do his service. So we are the hands of Christ, we are his body. What is worship? It's God putting himself into our hands. It's coming before him with the sacrifice in our hands, waving it before the Lord, saying like David, we give thee but thine own. Everything that we're giving to him, he's first given to us. But all the worship of the Lord Jesus is in the hands of sinners. God doesn't manufacture it. Angels can't do it. The worship of the Redeemer is in our hands to do it. So when we come to the New Testament, to our amazement, we see that God in a physical sense, has put himself into the hands of sinners. There's Mary holding this little babe in her hands. But when we come to Calvary, Peter will say, you took him with your wicked hands and you crucified him. You slew him. 
up by the determinate counsel of God. So, the sovereignty of God is not God acting like a bully. God puts himself into our hands, but he overrules our stupidity and brings blessing to us in spite of ourselves. In all these ways, God has put himself into our hands, but in the end, the will of God is done. And this is how God works. This is the great mystery of the sovereignty of God, one of the great themes of the Bible. Number eight, humility the most surprising attribute of God. I don't think we often think of the humility of God, but when the Lord Jesus came into the world, it was perhaps the most shocking thing about his coming. He didn't come with a royal train. He didn't come with a great fanfare. He came in humility. He was born in a barn to a poor Jewish family, known as a Galilean lived his life in obscurity, slept on the hillside, worked in a carpenter shop. And Philippians 2 describes this self-humbling of Christ. Now, what did Christ come to do? He came to reveal God to us. Is God humble? Did Jesus become a servant when he showed up? No, God is a servant. God feeds the human race. He feeds the atheist his breakfast every morning. He sends his reign on the just and the unjust. If it was not for the services of God, none of us would survive a day. He's constantly ministering to us. So when we think about the Lord Jesus coming into the world and manifesting humility, and he says the secret of the way of godliness is humility. Before honor is humility. If you want to get to God, you're going to have to humble yourselves under his hand and he will exalt you in due time. And so humility, we learn, is the chief characteristic that determines our status in the world to come. He says, I've served you, you ought to serve one another. Not like the Gentiles who everybody has a boss, but someone who humbles themselves and seeks to be a servant to the most number of people, that person will be greatest in the kingdom. He's speaking about himself. He is the servant of servants. So this idea of humility is one of the powerful messages in the scripture, the secret of world government. The world has tried every other form of government, but the one kind of government that has yet to be tried will be a rule by servant kings. Those who, as it were, want to get off the throne and get down and wash other people's feet. That's going to be the secret of the coming government of God. Number nine, the two wings of truth balance as the key to the believer's success. Yes, God has given us a book that is foolproof because he knew what he was working with. And so there are ideas in the Word of God that balance each other. And when we understand this as we study the Bible, it greatly increases our apprehension of the things of God. So every time I discover something, I should discover two things. It should be double blessing every time I study the Word. And we begin to see the symmetry in the Word of God. So as we read through the Scripture, we see prophecies and their fulfillment. We see types and their antitypes. We see questions and their answers, actions and consequences. These are important to notice. This is the pattern that's given to us all the way through scriptures. We also see certain trends from partial to complete, from material to spiritual, from temporal to eternal from concrete to abstract, from earthly to heavenly. All of these patterns that allow us to anticipate where God is going with something. So as we look at all of these prototypes in the Old Testament, they're preparing our thinking for the answer, for the conclusion, for the fulfillment that we have later on in Scripture. This is a great safeguard against error. So it's like an equation. If you do something to one side of the equation, you have to do the same thing to the other. So there were people who talked about the man-woman functional equality in the church. But as we look at this, we see there's a pattern 
there's a, a picture that's given to us on the other side of the equation, and that is the Christ-Church relationship. So the man-woman relationship mirrors this. So do we want the church to be telling Christ what to do? Because on this side, women are not to be teachers in the church because the women are playing the role of the bride, the loved one, and the men are playing the role of the servant lover. And so God says, I want you to be consistent with these roles because on the other side of the equation, we're speaking in our actions of Christ and his church. This is why marriage is so important because the husband-wife relationship, again, pictures Christ and his relationship to his bride. So if we can start to see the symmetry, when we see some truth over here, there will be a balancing truth somewhere else. Truth flies on two wings. It's a great idea when we're studying the Bible to look for these corresponding truths that balance our understanding of the Word of God. That's one of the greatest difficulties. The reason people fall into error is because they have half a truth. The devil cuts a truth in half, gives this half to this side, human responsibility, divine sovereignty, and says, now fight about it. Instead of understanding that there are many scriptures that put the two ideas in balance so that we are kept in the middle of the road and don't end in one of the ditches on either side. Then number 10, the God who turns curses into blessings. What a tremendous truth this is. We see right in the Garden of Eden, right? The story of the serpent and the seed and the sorrow and the soil and the sweat. These are the judgments that are brought on Satan, on the ground, and on Adam and Eve, on the human race. What does the Lord do with that? When we go to Calvary, we see all of these there. We see the corn of wheat falling into the ground to produce this mighty harvest. We see the thorns around his brow, turning that, as it were, into a diadem, into a crown of glory for his people. His blood like sweat falling from his brow. All of these pictures that are used in the Old Testament, the crushing of the serpent's head, right? So the Lord takes the curse of Eden and turns it into something far more wonderful so that we're not given Eden back, we're given heaven. We're not simply creatures, but now the sons of God. We don't simply have the restoration of natural life, but eternal life. Everything that we're given is so much better. And the Lord Jesus has accomplished that for us and has turned the curse of Eden into the blessings of heaven. We have the curse on Cain. He's a fugitive. He went out from the presence of the Lord, right? And this idea that the whole human race has ended up vagabonds and strangers in the world. We don't belong here. We know we don't belong. The question is, where are we going, right? And so the Lord comes in and offers a salvation to us. We have the curse on Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be. Sounds like a put down, but in fact, this turn of phrase, holy of holies, king of kings, lord of lords, is always used as a superlative. And the tribe of Ham, the nations that came from Ham, they become the, the servants of the human race. They provide all of the technology, the field crops, the domesticated animals, all come from the people of Ham, the people of color. And the Lord takes what seems to be a curse and turns it into a blessing. We have the curse of hanging on a tree. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And what does God do with that? He takes the Lord Jesus, allows men to hang him on a tree, and puts the curse of a broken law on him. Christ bears the curse of a broken law and turns it into blessing. We think of the curse of death. This is the judgment of God against sin. What does God do with that? He turns death into the doorway to every blessing. Every blessing I will ever enjoy can be traced back to death. 
either the death of Christ on the cross for us, uh, our physical death, which takes us into the presence of God, or spiritual death, the judging of sin in our lives, this is the path to blessing at every case. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He has taken death and made it ours. Paul says death is yours. Death has become a doorway into the presence of God, into the blessing of God. So we look forward to the day when there will be no more curse. We read in Revelation 22, 3, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Ah, there we are. The servant of servants shall we be. So that all of these things that initially began as curses, the Lord takes them and turns them into blessings. And if we can just learn to trust God, the things that we look at in our lives and think this is the worst thing that ever happened to me, you watch and see what God can do with it. He takes these negatives and turns them into positives, takes our liabilities and turns them into assets. So much so that Paul says, I've learned to boast in my infirmities, in my weaknesses, because that's where the power of Christ rests on me. This is a grand theme that runs from cover to cover through the Word of God, and we begin with this sad story of the curse, and it ends with no more curse. God has turned the curses into blessings, and when we trust Him, we see that happen in our own lives too. So these are big ideas to follow through the scriptures. May God bless us and encourage us as we look for these big ideas, the grand picture, the picture on the, the puzzle box, so to speak, and see God's grand purposes in history so that all of the component parts then begin to fit together in our minds as we follow these themes.